being a verb that is making that time dash. Um, when you're negative, your ratios look a lot different than they do for the app. I mean, it's here it's the opposite. They have the six minute one AC, and then all of a sudden you're in a lead. You get seven minutes right away. Your other speech ratios is a one to one. It's a six to six. Like you're in the lead if you're the negative here. Like you you should be having you have lots of time to get stuff done in your two speeches. So what can you do with that time and with those advantages that you have to pressure the affirmative into making mistakes? Because that's, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to make the affirmative make a coverage mistake or drop an argument or undercover turns, that's a coverage mistake, I guess, whatever, undercover turns on the bottom of the flow. And you're trying to put pressure on them to make mistakes that then in your rebuttal you can capitalize and frame into a negative battle. That's your job as the negative. Um, <clears throat> what can you do to do that? Well, you can be efficient, which is the same thing we talked about on the affirmative side. You can not read a three and a half minute diss ad or a two and a half minute top Kelly show. Don't do that. Like, they, I don't think they should ever be longer than a minute and a half, and that, I don't even like them that long. Like, I like them to be 45 seconds to a minute, personally. Um, now, on this topic, that might be a little different because those constructive engagement debates are gonna get kind of involved. And strategically, if you want to win the constructive engagement debate, you probably need to have a little more than a minute in your shell to win and be way ahead of the constructive engagement debate. Um, if you're running like an increased T though, or a substantial T, it shouldn't be more than a minute long. It just really shouldn't. You're leaking time at that point. Um, and so being efficient just in your argument creation will be good. I'll, I mean, in addition to being an efficient reader and then being an efficient speaker, you also need to be efficient in the structure of your arguments. You shouldn't have like extraneous impacts in the disad beyond once terminal. Like if you already have an impact that's big enough, don't read another card. Save the time. Um, don't read like three uniqueness cards in your one and C. Like that seems kind of dumb. Um, so don't read long T's. Don't read long disads. Um, do things too with argument diversity. That's a good way to put the pressure on the affirmative. So you can have lots of arguments, but if they're all the same kind of arguments then all you're doing is creating a lot of opportunities, A, for them to intersect, so the affirmative then can pick arguments that are, like we talked about before, linchpin arguments or keystone arguments, and beat those arguments. Or B, uh, there's places where they can group because the arguments are really similar. And so you want to be diverse. You want to have like a T, but maybe not a second T. Maybe instead you want some kind of other procedural voter, like, <coughs> like agent specification or over-specification or whatever you need. Because over-specification might be an argument this year because of the conditions that are going to be specified in some of these affirmatives to be quid pro quo. But if they don't have an advocate for the condition they put on Cuba, then you might start having warrants for why that's over-spec just to be topical. And that's the advantage they're gaining from it. <coughs> why that might be bad for you. So that's different than T. It's a different kind of argument than T. There's not a lot of crossover between over-specification and T especially depending on what your voters are. If you're, if you're keeping your voters on topicality away from the realm of fairness and instead having voters on T, uh, like on education or pick the, or jurisdiction or whatever, like even if you don't like those voters, the good thing about those voters and why they're strategically valuable is that if you run other procedurals that impact a fairness, now the fairness debate doesn't intersect. They can't read fairness isn't a voter arguments and get out of both procedurals. They can only get out of one of them. Um, and so that's something that you can do, is have diverse arguments, have disads that have different impacts. Don't read two impacts, two disads the impact of nuclear war. Like, try to read different kind of scenarios. So they have to answer different kinds of internal links, and they can't combine, they can't read no nuclear war will ever happen defense against your disads um, and get out of both of them if you don't want to give them, afford them that opportunity. And so argument diversity is really good. You want to play some defense on the app. Too. You want to give yourself time to have like a TD, a procedural, two disads, a counter plan maybe. You want to be able to have like five arguments at the end of the round. Like that might sound like a lot. If it does sound like a lot to you, there's a couple things that I want you to think about. Is think about how long have the shells been, been that you've been reading up to this point? Were they too long? Are you reading T's that sometimes go as long as two minutes? Because the two minutes should be two of your T's. That should be two of them and you should be done with T's. And now you have five minutes left to play around with and get two disads out in five minutes. Probably two disads a piece should take maybe four minutes at the most. And now you still have another minute left to do case arguments or like a, a small counter plan or 
like some turns, like two carded turns or whatever on the bottom, or two or three card turns at the bottom, or like analytic turns on the bottom of their affirmative. And so how efficient you are at the creation of that first argument, that shell that you're reading in your 1MC, that gives you the opportunity to put pressure on the affirmative with argument diversity. Um, you should also, when you get that, so that's, those are the main things you can do in your 1MC to put pressure on. Now, when you're in moving into that answering the 1AR stage, you need to be, like we talked about before, paying attention to how much time they spent on each one of your arguments um, and making choices based on their coverage. It isn't always based on time, you're right. Sometimes they make a bunch of bad arguments on a, even if they overcover it, if they're bad arguments, you should still go for it, right? Like you can point out why they're bad or why they don't apply or why they misunderstood your position and why that moots everything that they said. Like if you can do that, you should do it. Um, but probably most of the time, like just looking at a clock, you can make the right choices as to what to go for. I mean, also you can look at the ink on your flow, um, but sometimes people don't always flow all the arguments they made. So sometimes even ink on a flow can be deceiving because if you don't have every argument from your 1NC down on your flow, then it's hard to compare what the 1AR was answering to because you didn't have all those arguments there. Um, so even ink on the flow isn't always, the, the clock helps a lot. I think like timing your opponent's speeches and watching how much time they spend like really can open the door to a lot of easier decision making. Like if you're wondering what to go for, you can just think about like, well, because even if, even if they made good arguments, if they didn't make, spend a lot of time on that argument, that issue, then that argument doesn't appear to be very important to the critic because they didn't spend a percentage of their speech that was significant on that argument because they got in and got out and made a good argument or whatever. That means if they only spent 45 seconds on something, that's also all the arguments the judge heard. So if in your next speech you're like, okay, I'll commit two and a half minutes to that. Now all of a sudden, it's a lot more important that argument all of a sudden just got elevated in importance in the debate, and it's by a choice that you made, not a choice that your opponent made, and that makes an impression on the critic as well. Oh, one other thing about the one NC, and I kind of like briefly covered this a second ago, is that you should always, almost always, make a decision when you're planning your one NC to have not your best argument, but not your worst argument last. You should have a solid offensive argument as one of the last things that you say almost always in the one NC. And when we talk about changing order on the affirmative, one thing, maybe you, maybe you keep T at the top, but with the rest of the stuff, usually whatever they said at the bottom, you probably need to move up a tick or two. <coughs> you need to make sure that as you organize your 1AR when you're in the affirmative, you might want to move back up to the affirmative section right this time, that their defense is what you cover last. That way, if you're at the end of the timer on the one, in your 1AR and you are kind of out of breath and running out of time, you can at least make the argument that like, and their other arguments on harms are all defensive, even if they win these arguments cold, like I'm still ahead in this debate, like don't worry about them, they're not relevant. You can at least say that at the end of the, as the timer's going off, if it's all defense. You can't say that if there's two turns at the bottom that you haven't gotten to yet, right? Like then now you're gonna sound like an idiot. <coughs> so back to where we were before, we're talking about the one and R. Um, so make those strategic choices based on their coverage and also change the order, right? Like the first thing you wanna do at the top of your one and R is what? Kick positions that you're not going for. That's what you wanna do first. So that's gonna involve changing the order. You're not gonna kick the positions that you read first, second, and third in your one and C or whatever. I mean, if you do, it's just coincidence. And so the, the first things you go to, well, maybe you could overview first and then kick some positions. Um, I think you should always, always kick positions. Every time I like talk to debaters about rounds where they've lost and they don't understand where they lost the debate, a lot of times I ask them, well, what did you go for? And they say everything. And then that's usually why they lost the debate. Right? Like you don't have the time, even though it looks like that six three times skew for the affirmative would just be devastating for them if you went for everything. That's not the way it works. Because if you go for everything, Remember, it took you seven minutes to read all those arguments.